um, we're going to be preaching. We started in the book of Daniel, chapter number one. We're going to be reading through many stories going through the book of Daniel, the first few stories at least. And um, I really want to just, just take the time and preach about Daniel, the character in the Bible. Daniel is a great man of God. It says in Ezekiel 14, uh, you don't have to turn there, but it says in Ezekiel 14, verse 12, it says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. So that reference in Ezekiel 14, he's talking about, you know, bringing wrath upon a nation. And he's saying that, um, you know, they're, they've sinned so much that even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, like all three of them, like they wouldn't even get any, like no one else would get saved. He's like, they would deliver just their own souls by their righteousness. And all three of these men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were all preachers of righteousness. They were all in their times, like, I don't think it says it specifically about Daniel, but, but Job and Noah were men that were, that were more righteous than basically anyone else that was on the, in, the, in the world at that time. And I believe Daniel was also, he's grouped with those other two, and we see what a great man Daniel was <coughs> in the book here and the amount of faith, and the wisdom, and everything else that he had. And, and that is great company to have to be listed with Noah, Daniel, and Job. Now these are three men that you could use it as an example of believers, of men of God, that you could try to model your life after. And that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to pick out just some really great attributes of Daniel through some of these stories. And I'm sure, you know, everybody has their own faults and flaws, and flaws um, faults and flaws. You don't see very many of, of, of them with Daniel here in the book of Daniel. And we're not really going to focus on any of those. I didn't, um, I didn't extract any of those for the sermon tonight. We're going to look at all his positive attributes. The first one we see here, and one that Daniel's known for, is Daniel's wisdom. And the Bible, refer, in another chapter in Ezekiel, it refers to, essentially it's referring to Satan as having you know, more wisdom than Daniel. Because Daniel's known for his great wisdom. Daniel, in the latter books of Daniel, the last like five or six books of Daniel, all have prophecy that are concerning like end times events. Some of it was, was times to come in the future, like after, just after Daniel lived, but also then um, prophetic for end times. Lots of prophetic end times events. And a lot of people that study Revelation will go back to Daniel and, and compare the two and, and look up when these events are going to happen. Daniel was given a lot of wisdom by God. And he knew how to handle certain situations. So besides his prophecies, besides that wisdom that God had given him about, about future events, um, he also knew he had wisdom in just dealing with people. Even from a young age. It says here that they, that they were children that were brought in. See, at this time, there was, the children of Israel went into captivity. Right? King Nebuchadnezzar was the, was the king of the Chaldeans. He went out and he conquered essentially like the whole world. And he went out and he also conquered you know, the children of Israel. And he brought them captive into his land. And he went and, and took of the captives. It says um, in chapter 1 here, it says in verse number three, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish. So he's saying, okay, go look through the children of Israel, the people who were taken captive, and of the king's seed, and of the princes. And he's looking, he's, he just wants to take the best of the land, basically, and bring them to him. He said, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So he's trying to find the best of these people that were taken captive because he wants them to be useful for their kingdom, right? He says, I want them to know science. I want them to be smart, have wisdom, be cunning, you know, get the best of the best, get these kids we want to bring them in, and we want to teach them the learning, 
and the tongue of the Chaldeans. They wanted to integrate them into their society, into their culture, and say, hey, we're going to teach them. Get kids who are already smart, people who are going to be productive, people who are good at what they're doing, they're cutting, they're skillful. We're going to teach them our tongue, we're going to teach them to speak Chaldean, and we're going to teach them basically just the ways of the Chaldeans, the learning of the Chaldeans. They're going to teach them their culture, they're going to teach them all, all the stuff that they have the offer, have the offer, right? So this is who he's looking for. Now, Daniel and his three friends, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which was their, their Hebrew names, they all got new names for the Chaldeans um, <coughs> that were given to them by the, by the eunuch that was in charge over them. But Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, and um, Azariah, they were all selected among this group of people that, that had wisdom, that had skill, and they were going to be taught and to stand basically before the king. They were going to be counselors for the king. They were going to be asked um, on matters when the king wanted to ask him about something. Be basically at his disposal. So what happens here, just to get ourselves in context of the story, basically this, this eunuch, right, he's put in charge of all these people, right? He's the one. He needs to get them ready. He needs to help get them taught and, and so that they're ready eventually to go stand before the king. And what he needed to do, it says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So he's saying, okay, for three years, they're going to prepare these kids. We're going to get, you know, we're going to give them this food. We're going to give them this wine. Now, um, it doesn't say specifically, but most likely the, the food was probably being offered in sacrifice to idols. Um, they, they served multiple gods, as is evident elsewhere in the book of Daniel. Um, they were a heathen nation, but they also gave them wine, and the wine was most likely alcoholic. Sit still. If I have to tell you again, it's not going to be good for you. So they, he was instructed to give them the king's meat and wine. Now Daniel, look at what it says in verse number 8. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. So there you get, we, we could... We could probably safely assume that the meat was being offered and sacrificed unto idols because it said that Daniel did not want to defile himself with a portion of the, of the king's meat. Um, either that or it was some type of food uh, restriction that, that, that he wasn't allowed to eat, right? So it might have been something that was forbidden, something that he wasn't allowed to eat. Either way, um, it, was, it was something that he wasn't supposed to eat based on his religion. Because that would be the only reason why he wouldn't want to defile himself with the food is because it goes against what God had said that he was allowed to eat and what he should or shouldn't eat. And then it also says, not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. So what I love about this is that basically Daniel was not a compromiser. Okay, Daniel understood. He, he purposed in his heart. He already made this decision that he was not going to defile himself, okay? That goes without saying. He was not going to back down on this. He purposed in his house, I am not going to defile myself with this meat or with the wine that he drinks. But look at, look at how he approaches it. Look at how he, how he approaches this situation. He doesn't go with a hard attitude to this eunuch who basically had authority over him. I mean, they were taken captive. They were in a foreign land. He did not have that much authority. He could have just resisted and probably got thrown in prison or got killed or whatever and just said, no way, I'm never going to do this. You know, you can kill me, but I'm not going to defile myself. And he would not have been wrong in doing so. But he had, extra, he had wisdom. He was smart in how he dealt with people, how he handled this situation. Look at the second part of verse 8. It says, therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So did he go to him just say like, there's no way you can make me eat this stuff. I'd rather die. That's not the attitude he took when confronted with the situation. He took a more wise example. Just said, hey, do you think it would be possible? Do you think, do you think it would be all right if I, don't, you know, if I don't partake in this food and this drink? I don't need, want to defile myself. It goes against my religion. He handled it in a way that is, that is very wise. And here's the thing. Look at verse 9. It says, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And see, God already worked it out that he was going to be brought into favor, but you're going to be brought into favor 
with people when you don't have that type of attitude. Now, it doesn't mean that you back down on what you believe. You know, he wasn't going to back down at all. I believe that firmly that it says when he purposed in his heart, he wasn't going to defile himself. He wasn't going to defile himself. But there's ways that you can deal with things that are a lot smarter, a lot wiser than other ways, right? Either way, you know, you ought to be keeping yourself from doing wrong and from breaking God's commandments. But think about this. I mean, if you're on the job and, um, You can put yourself almost in the exact same situation, right? Let's say there's a company meeting or, or like the boss takes you out to lunch. And the boss wants to order up some wine or something, some alcohol to drink. And he's like going to order you some. You know, you don't have to be like, just throw it, make a big scene and be like, there's no way you're ever going to make, you know, just kind of talk to talk to your boss that way. You can do the exact same thing and just be like, look, you know, I'd appreciate it. You know, I'd really don't want to do this, you know, I, I, um, I have religious beliefs against this, and, you know, I, I just don't, I don't want to do this. And that's a, a much smarter way of handling a situation where you can still remain completely firm in your beliefs, not back down an inch, but be able to deal with people in an appropriate way, in a way that's just, it just shows wisdom. And it just shows you're going to get a lot more done with people when, when um, you can deal with them in a, in a in a softer way sometimes, um, especially people in authority, people that have rule over you. I mean, in this situation, the eunuch was essentially their boss. I mean, he was taking care of him. He was responsible for him. And what happens is he entreats him and he says, okay, well, let me just prove it to you, right? Because the, the eunuch was worried. He's thinking that like, well, look, he's like, it's going to be my, ne it's my next on the line. If I present you before the king and you guys are looking like, you're not well fed, you don't, you know, you're not looking very good, because he was worried, he didn't know what, you know, they wanted to be fed with pulse and water. Pulse, I think, is, I don't know exactly what it is, I think it's some kind of like beans and lentils, like that type of a, of a diet. And he's thinking like, well, no, he was thinking, you know, the king's meat is good and the wine is good for him, that he didn't want them being sickly or not looking quite as healthy, not looking quite as good as up to par. So they're saying, okay, well, look, I understand it, but just, just give us 10 days. Try it out. Right? Just, just prove us, test us, and that's exactly what he did. And at the end of the 10 days, they were found fatter in flesh and, and, and um, just better looking than all the rest of the people who were given the, the king's portion. So the eunuch said, okay, fine, well, I'll, I'll listen to you. And he got exactly what he wanted. He didn't have to back down on anything he believed. He didn't defile himself, yet he was able to, to, um, you know, to stand his ground. And, you know, it says that God had brought Daniel into favor. I, I, this reminded me of, of Jesus Christ in Luke 2.52. The Bible says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Daniel was a man who also, he increased in favor with God and man. He was someone that <clears throat> God was well pleased with him. And first and foremost, we should all be looking to be well pleasing to God. I mean, ultimately, you, you shouldn't care what man thinks about you if it's going to be contrary to what God thinks of you, right? God gets first. God gets priority. No matter what anybody else thinks, we need to make sure that we're doing right by God. But there's absolutely nothing wrong. And I mean, even Jesus Christ himself, you can grow in favor with man as well, with God and man, as long as you make sure your priorities right and you're in favor with God and he's pleased with what you're doing. It makes sense. And you be, you show wisdom, when you're also in favor with man. I mean, one of the qualifications for being a bishop is, um, you know, having a good report, right? You want to, you need to have a good report of just men around you. You need to be a good example as a Christian. We're getting this a little bit further with Daniel about how great, um, well, we're going to get that actually right now. <clears throat> Look at um, verse number 17 of Daniel chapter 1. It says, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, here's the thing. God, if, if you want to be smarter, if you want wisdom and learning and understanding, God can give that to you. And that's one thing that we ought to be praying for. And one thing, if you, the more you study the Bible, I don't care who you are, I guarantee you, you will get smarter. Not just in things pertaining to understanding like the Bible, but the Bible deals with everything. The, the Bible has all of the answers of life that we need. 
I believe that you will get smarter in all aspects of your life. And you, it's not something you're going to notice immediately or necessarily notice at all. It's something that happens gradually because the learning is going to be slow. But the more you dedicate yourself to reading your Bible, to studying the Bible, to learning it, and to praying to God, God will give you that wisdom. And I believe His wisdom is going to come through His Word. And, and that is one of the reasons why these, these four children, you know, God gave them this knowledge and this skill. He saw, for one, hey, they're not going to back down. They, they believe what I say. They're going to obey what, what I tell them to do. They're not going to defile themselves. They're committed to God, and He's going to open up their, their learning and their skill and give them wisdom and understanding. And it says in verse 20, it says, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. So the magicians, astrologers, these are basically the smart people that, that the world created, that, that his kingdom could create. These were the smartest men that he had to rely on in his you know, state-run education or whatever he could come up with through their own religious system or whatever it may be, these were, those were the best men. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were 10 times better than 10 times. That's a lot. I mean, that's, you're, you're way above the cut. You're way above the rest when you're 10 times better. And this is something that we as Christians ought to strive for. You as a Christian person, whether you, if you're a worker on the job, when you're compared among other people, you ought to be looked at by your boss and be like, man, this guy is 10 times better worker than everybody else. That's the type of example you ought to set forth as being someone who's a hard worker, being someone who's wise, being someone who, you know, you keep yourself from the sins of this world and you keep your nose in this book, you're going to get smarter and you're not going to, you're, you're going to excel above people who don't do that stuff. I mean, the people who are all in this world, it's just going to drag them down. It's going to suffer in all areas of life. The more sin you're into, the more it's going to drag you down and just pull you into bondage. And when you're truly free of the bondage, when you're truly free from that, from a sinful, wicked life, hey, you can grow and, and excel and be ten times better than the rest. And this is a great example for a Christian to have so that, you know, basically, ultimately, not to, to slander or badmouth the name of Christ. So when someone looks at you, but you're like a really lazy person, you don't get anything done, and be like, oh yeah, that's a Christian, it's going to look bad, it's going to speak bad for Christ. Now whether it should or shouldn't, that's the way it is. We ought to make sure that we live above reproach, that we live life where we're hard workers, and we do, and we do as much work as we possibly can for God. That's the way that we all live, and that's the way that Daniel lived. And we see his first attribute, you know, we're going over tonight what made Daniel so great, and one of the first things he did, one of the first things that he has is wisdom that was given to him by God. And he recognized it here in the fact that he was humble. So the second attribute of Daniel, that even with all his wisdom, he was still an extremely humble man. Now look at chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. See, Daniel was a humble man. He gave God the glory for all that he did, not only did he give his God glory for everything they did publicly, he also did it privately. He truly had a humble heart. It wasn't even just for show. We're going to see that here in the story. Look at verse number 12 of Daniel chapter 2. The Bible reads, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Basically, just to bring you up to speed, okay, the king has this vision. He has this dream. And his dream really just messes with him. He's just like, like he wakes up out of his dream and... It really bothered him. It vexed him. But he forgot what it was. So he calls all of the astrologers and the soothsayers, right? And he, he brings them up and says, I need you to interpret this dream for me. And they say, okay, well, you know, tell us what the dream was and, and we'll give you the interpretation. We'll, you look, we'll let you know what it means. And he goes, yeah, but see, I need you to interpret for, for me and I don't know it. He says, this way I'll know that you're not just, just feeding me a bunch, of, you know, a bunch of garbage, that you're actually able to do the interpretation if you can tell me the dream and the interpretation also. So everyone was like, Whoa, wait a minute. Like, no one has ever asked this before. You can't expect us to know what you dreamed and then be able to, to tell you what it means. He's, they're like, nobody can do that. They're like, they said, like, the gods can only do that. Right? Like, nobody knows that. So this is where we catch up in the story. 
So the king is angry and he's very furious, so he commands to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Right? The king's just like, you guys can't tell me what my dream was. Fine, well, I'm just going to kill all of you, which not a very wise thing to do, kind of flying off the handle there. But so the decree goes out, verse 13, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So now they're going after Daniel and his friends to kill him. And then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. Again, Daniel's showing, showing counsel, he's showing great wisdom when he responds to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. So he goes up to the captain of guard that, that, whose job it is to go and kill these men. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? So he's asking, why, you know, why is it so fast? Why is he going out to kill everybody? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. And see, he approached him again. He didn't go say it like, you know, um, making some kind of an argument, like, oh, you can't kill me because you know, I didn't do anything wrong. It didn't matter. He just asked, why is the decree so hasty? And that gets an answer from him. And, you know, Arioch tells him everything that happened. Then Daniel went in, in verse 16, and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah's companions. So he tells his friends about it. Verse 18, <clears throat> that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So basically he goes to these guys and says, look, we need to pray to God. We need to ask God for mercy here. You know, you got to help us out. Let's all get together. Let's pray about this. Let's beg God so that we don't die with the rest of these people. And maybe God will step in and help us out here, right? And it says in verse 19, it says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. So that night, Daniel gets a vision. He sees, you know, it's revealed. He understands what it was that the, that the king dreamt about. And the interpretation, it says, Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So immediately, Daniel's given thanks to God. As soon as it's revealed to him, in a night vision, Daniel blesses the God of heaven. Nobody sees that. No one knows about that. Daniel knows about that. But this is the humble heart that Daniel had. He's, you know, thank you, God. Da God hears his prayer, and, da and he receives it. Daniel says, thank you, God. Blessed be the God of heaven. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Again, giving full glory, credit, honor unto God. God's the one that gave him that wisdom. And you, if you're a smart person today, I mean, God gave you that wisdom. God gave you that brain. God gave us his word. God gives us his understanding. He gets the credit. It's not by our own, you know, great power and might that, that we have these things that belongs to God. And, he, and, and Daniel was an extremely humble man and recognized that and knew that. And you know what? God answers Daniel's prayer a lot in the book of Daniel. And it's a short book. And, and God answers Daniel's prayer a lot. And I believe it's because he gives him the respect, he gives him the honor, he gives him the credit, and he's a faithful man. Look at verse 21, it says, And he changeth the times and the seasons, he removeth kings and setteth up kings, he giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Talking about God, God does all these things. He revealeth the deep and secret things, he knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now that we what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So he goes on, and it's a pretty lengthy thank you to God, and just giving praise and honor unto God in his name for, for how great he is, and, and how he's the one that gives knowledge and understanding. He's the one that gives might. He's the one that gives wisdom to the wise. And then jump down to verse 27. It says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealed a secret. So he's, now he's going to the king. He just received this knowledge. He gives thanks unto God. You know, he received it in the vision of the night. Now he's going to the king. And again, now he would have the opportunity to basically just take all credit for, for this thing being revealed to him because now he knows. He knows the matter. He knows the king's matter. He knows the interpretation of it. He could have just gone to the king and been like, well, I figured it out, king. It's this and this and this, you know, and just taken all the credit for himself. But he doesn't do that. He's a humble man. He says, there is a God in heaven that revealed the secrets. 
and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And then he explains it to him. And then look at verse number 30. It says, But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. He's saying, look, it's not that I'm better than anybody else. It's not that I'm much smarter and I know so much more than anybody else. He said, that is not why the secret is revealed unto me. It says, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. And so basically he gives, he gives God the credit. He's a humble man. Daniel has a lot of wisdom. He's a very wise man. Number two, he's a humble man. But number three, he has a lot of boldness too. We notice here, he's dealing with, first of all, he's dealing in chapter one with, with this, this eunuch. Right, the guy that had the authority of all of over all of them, he had enough boldness to go up to him and, and even just say, "Hey, you know, I don't want to defile myself with with the king's portion of the meat." He said, and and he's in chapter two, he's willing to to even go up to the king who wants all the wise men dead, and say, "Wait, wait, wait, you know, let me get the interpretation for you." But even more than that, and look, turn to Daniel chapter four if you would. Because Daniel, Daniel shows a lot of boldness all throughout this book. And that's something, that's something that, that goes hand in hand with being filled with the Spirit. Daniel was a man of God. He was filled with God's Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. He, was, he didn't have it dwelling him, but the Holy Ghost was upon him. Daniel, I mean, was a man of God, and, um, and he preached the truth. He's a preacher of righteousness. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't trim the message. He didn't compromise. Even in the face of the king, look at chapter 4, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour. This is another dream, by the way. Sorry, to bring you up to speed. Chapter 4. Chapter 3 is all about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not bowing down to the golden idol, getting thrown in the burning, fiery furnace. Awesome story. Read it. That's not what this sermon is about. I thought about preaching on it, but I changed my mind. Um, where they don't bow down to worship the, the graven image. They get thrown into the furnace. And they don't die. They don't even smell like smoke. They're walking around just fine in this fire. And it's, an, it's a great story. Read the book. Read the entire book of Daniel if you haven't done it before. But in chapter 4, so now the king has another dream. He has another vision. Right? Daniel already explained the previous one to him. Chapter 4, he's got another vision. And, of course, nobody's able to explain it to him. This time he actually is able to tell the story. He didn't require that they, they come up with the, with the dream and the interpretation. This time he's just asking for an interpretation. No one else is able to do it. Then it says in verse 19, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not thy, the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. So, as any good preacher does, Daniel gives counsel to the king, even though it's a hard message for, for most people to receive, because this dream that he had is totally against the king. So, Daniel still just tells the truth. And we're not going to go through the entire interpretation or anything like that, but basically this dream that the king has is not good for the king. It's, it's, it's telling about how he's going to, you know, he's going to lose the kingdom. He's going to become, he's going to receive the heart of a beast. He's going to be eating grass like the ox. His hair is going to become like eagle's feathers. His fingernails are going to turn into like claws because he's just going to be just, just crazy, just, just left out in the wilderness. And, and he's going to be like an animal. Like basically that's what, and that's what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel's the one that has to explain this to him. So this is the king. I mean, this is the top guy in charge, and he's like in charge basically of the realm of the whole world. So you're talking to the most powerful guy in the world. He brings you in to explain his dream to him. Not necessarily an easy thing to do, but Daniel had boldness, and he, and, he, and he told the truth. He had integrity. Regardless of what it meant for him or for anyone else, I mean, it, the king had a history of flying off the handle doing some rash things, right? When he got upset, when he wanted to kill all the wise men. So Daniel brings, you never want to be the bearer of bad news, right? You never want to be that person that has to come and say, this is really bad news for you. But Daniel does it. And not only that, he gives him counsel. Look at verse 27. After he gives him the whole interpretation, he says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be accepted un acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins 
by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So he's saying, look. I mean, basically he's telling him, like, knock off all the sinning. Okay, you need to stop doing that. Your iniquities show mercy to the poor. And one of the reasons why this was coming upon the king is because he was proud. He was lifted up. He thought that everything in the kingdom was because of his own might and his own power and not recognizing that it was of God. But, uh, and, and God abased him and humbled him. And Daniel's just trying to give him counsel be like, look, this is the vision. This is the interpretation. This is going to happen to you, but, but just, just listen to me. Break off thy sins. Do righteousness. You know, show mercy to the poor. And, and maybe that'll lengthen your time of, of, of tranquility where, you, where none of this stuff is going to come upon you. God will look upon what you do and, and he'll bless you for that. And even though that's not always, again, that's not always the most, po you know, it's not the most positive message. People don't want to hear that they're in sin, that they have iniquity, that they need to change and need to do something, you know, because people generally have a good attitude about themselves and a good view of themselves. We know that Nebuchadnezzar had a good view of himself. He thought highly of himself. He was very proud, but Daniel is still giving him good counsel. As any good preacher ought to, you ought not to just, just ignore um, when, when someone needs good counsel like he did, when you can see something that's going to happen that's bad, and, and Daniel was able to see, he knew what the interpretation of the vision was that was coming towards um, the king of Babylon, but Anybody with a lot of wisdom can see when a person is headed towards destruction in their life. Just by the decisions that they make, by the actions that they make. If you know someone relatively well, and you can kind of see the path they're on in their life, anyone that has some wisdom, that, has some, that knows the Bible a little bit, can understand and see, hey, they're headed down a path of destruction. And those people, you need to help. And again, the way, the way that he approached them, he said, O king... Let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off the sins of thy righteousness. Of, of break off thy sins by righteousness. And thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be a lengthening. He's, he's like, basically he's trying to plead with them. Saying, look, change your ways. Get rid of these sins and do this. And this is a way that we can entreat people as well. When you see someone that's on that path of destruction. But it takes boldness to be able to do that. And Daniel had that boldness. Now, even with the next king, Nebuchadnezzar has a son. So when all this stuff happens to Nebuchadnezzar, he's out, excuse me, for like, I think it was seven years. He's out in the wilderness and all the, you know, he's just, has the heart like a beast. And his son takes over the kingdom. <coughs> Again, Daniel doesn't tone down the message for him. You see, what happens is Nebuchadnezzar's son takes over the kingdom. He's having this party. And turn to go to chapter number five of Daniel. He's having this party with his friends, with his concubines, with his wives. He goes, basically he calls, bring in the, um, the vessels that they took out of the, um, the temple of God. So when the Babylonians came and they, and they took all the children of Israel captive, right? They also went into the temple of God and they stole a lot of the artifacts, a lot of the, 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 the things used for service. You know, they were, they were made with gold and silver. They were precious. You know, they were worth a lot of money. So they came and they, and they just looted that and they took that back and they put it in the king's storehouse. So this guy's having a party. He's like, like, bring the vessels out. So basically what they're doing is they're just, they're drinking alcohol. They're just drinking wine out of, you know, these, these whole, the stuff that was used for um, the sacrifices and the holy stuff in, the, in God's temple. And they're just taking these cups and they're just partying and, you know, and using them. Um, for that, for that purpose, totally just disrespectful and um, and not caring at all. So what happens is while they're having this party, there's a, a it says a form of a hand writes on the wall. They're having this party. All of a sudden, they see this hand just just writing something on the wall, and um, that's where the phrase also comes from. You see the writing on the wall. I okay, see the writing on the wall. It comes from the story in the book of Daniel. Where they see that all they see is a form of a hand, he writes on the wall. And they get so freaked out, it says that like his knees are smiting together, right? I mean, he's literally just, just so scared. Which, I mean, they're there, they're having this proud party, oh, ha, you know, we're so great. It says they're praising the, um, the gods of gold and of silver. 
and um, they see this hand, so then they need Daniel to come and interpret it because they couldn't understand what it said. It was written in another language, they didn't know what it meant, and no one else was able to interpret it for them. Again, they go to the world, they go to the soothsayers, the magicians, the astrologers. No one knows what it means, so they call in Daniel, and um, it says here in chapter 5, verse 17, is where we pick up. I'm trying to give you the backstory because um, my, the, the significant portion that we're dealing with um, doesn't have to do with the rest of it. So verse 17, it says, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be divided thyself. So the king offered him like these gifts and stuff, saying, Look, if you can interpret this, I'm going to give you, you know, um, <coughs> clothed in scarlet. You're going to have a chain of gold about your neck, and I'm going to make you a ruler. I'm going to make you like a third ruler, right? Daniel's like, Look, keep the gifts to yourself and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God, O, o thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. Basically, your father had all power. He was over everybody, everybody feared him. He was given everything. It says, God gave thy father this kingdom and all this power. It says in verse 20, But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him, and he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. Now he's going to talk to his son, Belshazzar, says, And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. He said, look, you knew about all this from your father. You knew that, that all this happened to him. You knew he didn't give honor and glory to God. You knew he had this great kingdom. He says, but you haven't humbled your heart, even though you knew everything that happened to your father. It says in verse 23, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. He said, you've, you've, you've lifted up yourself against God. Now, again, that type of speech takes boldness. That type of response, he's the, act, he's the king. Belshazzar is the king at that time. He goes in with boldness and he just says, look, You've lifted, you knew about all this stuff with your father. You knew he was full of pride. You saw what happened to him. You saw what God did unto him. Yet now you're lifted up against the Lord. Now you have pride. It says, <clears throat> And they have brought the vessels of this house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and of brass, iron, wood and stone, which see not nor hear nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. He says, God holds your breath in his hand. God can extinguish your breath like that. And he says, you haven't glorified him. That takes a lot of boldness to be able to go to the king, to the man that has the power to just, I mean, it all it takes is for him just to get upset at hearing that. Then just off with your head. You're gone. Get out of here. Right? But Daniel was a wise man. Daniel had a lot of knowledge. Daniel <coughs> was a humble man, but he also had boldness. And the last thing we're going to see here is that Daniel was faithful even unto death. Daniel had a lot of faith. He was a faithful man. He trusted in God. Look at chapter number 6. And we're going to see in verse number 2. Some, some more great attributes about, about Daniel. We're almost done. We're going to wrap things up here real soon. It's my last point, Daniel being faithful in the death. Daniel chapter 6, look at verse number 2. It says, And over these three presidents, well, let's, start, let's just start with verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. So now this is a new king. This is after King Nebuchadnezzar and after Belshazzar's son. Now we have Darius. Okay? Because... What happened was, basically, in that last story with his son, the writing on the wall, was basically saying that he was just going to lose the kingdom. And he was killed that night. So Daniel 
interprets it for him. And the king does as he said he was going to do to him. He didn't, you know, he didn't get mad at him. He, he gave him the, the gold necklace and, and clothed him in scarlet. And he made him the third ruler of the kingdom. And then that night, he was killed. The king. The king. The king Belshazzar was killed. Not Daniel. The king was killed because that's what essentially the, the interpretation of, of the writing on the wall was that you're going to lose your kingdom. And, um, and, that's, and that's what it was. It says, the interpretation was, just so you know, this is the interpretation of the thing. It says, meaning God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. That's what the, what the, the interpretation was at the end of chapter 5. So that, that king, basically the next king comes in Darius takes over because Belshazzar was killed and um, <coughs> Darius the Median took the kingdom. So look at verse number one now. It says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes. So he's setting up new rulers, right? He's taking over the kingdom. He's setting up 120 princes to, to rule over the, this whole area, right? This huge kingdom, which should be over the whole kingdom. Verse two, it says, And over these three presidents, so you've got 120 princes that are out there to rule all the all these general areas, big areas, and then he has three presidents that are going to rule them. Those 120 report to these three, these three presidents. It says, of whom Daniel was first. So Daniel's remain in a, in, a, in a very high position of authority. Daniel was a wise man. There was no reason not to. I mean, he was a very smart man, a very wise man, and a very humble man. And it says that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. So this is also a way for the king to kind of distance himself from anything that goes wrong. He's kind of he's kind of able, he's still a figurehead, he's still in charge, but he's got this chain of command to where he can absolve responsibility and put out anyone he wants. I mean, whether it be one of the three presidents or the 120 princes, he's kind of distanced himself here that the king should have no damage. And then um, it says, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So now the king's thinking, like, Daniel's such a great guy. He's such an excellent spirit. Like, he's just so good at what he does. He's just so wise that the king's just like, I'm thinking about just setting this guy over everything. No longer being one of the three presidents, but just let's just let him rule. Where he would still be, of course, the king, but, like, let's just let Daniel take over everything. So that's what he's thinking here. Now, Daniel's... You know, colleagues don't like this. <laughs> Nobody likes to see somebody excelling to that point to where you're like, you know, you're the favorite kid. You're the favorite student, right? You're the teacher's pet. Because that's what Daniel was. Now, he was that way just because he was good and he was righteous and he deserved it. Um, but the other people don't like to see that. I mean, especially start getting in a higher position of authority and stuff. Hey, they like that power. They don't want to have someone else over them. Um, and that's why oftentimes you see even in the, in the Bible like these kings are, are being killed and someone else is taken over because it's just this thirst for power. They want to they be in charge. They don't want to be, be ruled. They want to be the ruler. And then it says in, um, it says in verse 4, it says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So these guys, they don't like this. They, don't, they can see what's happening. They can see that the, that the king is preferring Daniel over everybody. They don't like it. They want to bring him down a notch, right? Because, I mean, everything this guy is doing is good. He's, 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 you know, he's ruling well, and um, they're trying to find an occasion against him, but he can't. And this is a great a great testimony, a great attribute of Daniel to have, and that's something we should all strive for, that if somebody's looking to find fault in you, make it so that they can't find anything. Make it so that your enemies are going to want to look, they're going to try hard, they're going to try to find something that's wrong with you, some kink in your, in your armor, and they should be able to find none. This is the type of righteous man that Daniel was. This is why, we, why we're looking at him today. One of the main reasons is because he was that great of a, of a person. I mean, he was, he was listed with Noah and Job um, by God and, you know, in the Bible, by, basically by Ezekiel, but, but from the word of the Lord that he was 
that he was preaching, he's elevated as such a great man of God. I mean, you can look at this man and not find fault with him. And that's what these people wanted to do. They wanted to bring him down. And see, people, with you as a, as a Christian, people are going to want to take you down a notch. When you start cleaning up your life and you're living a righteous life, people aren't going to like that because what that does is it makes them look worse. When you do better, when you're excelling, when you're working hard on the job, hey, all of a sudden, the stuff that other people are doing, especially people that might be closer to your equals, when you just excel and you're constantly outperforming, you're constantly doing this, you know what you're doing? You're raising the standard. You're raising the bar because you're outperforming everybody. That makes them look bad. And most people don't want to have to work that hard or maybe they can't even do it. I don't know. Either way, people don't like to do that because it makes them look worse. And nobody wants to make, you know, have themselves look worse. And what they do then, and what they did with Daniel, and you've got to be aware of this too, when you start living a more righteous life, is people are going to want to try to take you down. And that may form, come in the form of temptations or in attacks or in whatever. And what they do with Daniel here, we're going to see what they do with Daniel. Because it says here, it says, For as much as he was faithful, Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Daniel was a faithful man. He was faithful to God. No matter what, his, his priorities went to God, and he did what God wanted him to do first. So then it says in verse 5, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So they're saying, okay, we're not going to be able to find anything wrong with this guy unless we could basically make it happen through the law of his God. Because they knew that he followed, the, he was obedient to the laws of God, and that he had that integrity, and he had that faith, and that the only way they can make anything happen is if they were able to use that against him, use the law of God against him. So they made this law. In verse seven, it says, "All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, and the princes, the counselors, and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute, and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god." or man, for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. And this is the story that we were talking about so many earlier today, Sebastian, the den of, about Daniel being cast into the den of lions. So what they do is they make this law where they say, okay, look, for 30 days, if anybody just decides to go straight to God with a petition, they say, we're going to throw him in a den of lions. They say, first they have to go to you, O king. They have to go through you first. And the king's just like, yeah, sure, okay, whatever, sounds great. And he enacts the law, which was a dumb move by Darius the king, because Darius liked Daniel. I mean, he wanted to set him up as, as over the whole realm. And the thing is, he didn't know what these, what these presidents were doing. He didn't know what these rulers were doing. He didn't know that they hated Daniel and were trying to, trying to, um, to make something happen against him. Right? He was oblivious, but it was, it was foolish of him just to sign this into law. So he signs this into law, and he says, okay, yeah, no one can go to any God unless they come to me first. Well, let's see what Daniel's response is to that. Because Daniel finds out about this law. Look at verse number 10 of chapter 6. The Bible says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so he knew it went into law, it passed, right? It wasn't up for debate in the Senate and the House. This thing went up to pass. And it got signed by the king. It says he went into his house. And his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So did it change anything in his habits whatsoever? Not at all. He left his windows open. He didn't hide himself. I mean, he could have shut his windows. He could have, he could have closed up and done it secretly. But that's not what he used to do. That's not what he did aforetime. There's a lot of things he could have he could have stopped. He could have he could have stopped praying. But that would have been wrong. That would have been a sin. Three times a day, he didn't cut it down. He said, just as he did before him. This law meant nothing to him because it would contradict the law of God. There is no mediator between God and man other than the man Christ Jesus. He's not gonna go to the king to get permission to pray to God or to make petition to God. There's no way he's gonna do this. Okay? And so at this point, he just says, whatever, I'm just going to do it. Now, being faithful sometimes takes a lot of guts. Daniel did not change his bit. He truly had the proper fear of God in his life. Because here's the thing, this will motivate a person. If you have the proper fear of God, 
instead of the fear of man. See, the fear of man in this case is going to be like, I'm going to fear that, that men are going to arrest me and they're going to put me in jail or they're going to put me to death. Fearing what man can do unto you. What you ought to be is fearing what God can do unto you. Because you don't want to disobey God's commandment just because of the fear of men. So no matter what law comes down, and listen to me now, because I don't know what times we're going to go through. I don't know if the end times are going to happen in our times or not, but I believe they probably will. If any law is passed from this government that's prohibiting you from serving God, from going out, from doing the things that the Bible says that we need to do as a Christian, you do not obey those laws. You do not. You should have the fear of God. Fear what God would do to you for disobeying Him more than you would fear whatever it is that man can do unto you. Whatever it is that they can do, throw you in jail, kill you, execute you, torture you, whatever it is that they think that they can do. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, says in Ecclesiastes. Now, Daniel did not fear. He knew. He was faithful. He was faithful unto God to death. He did whatever it was that he was supposed to do, regardless of the outcome. And look what happens here. So in, in he basically, he gets thrown into the den of lions. They, they, they've got this, they've got um, these lions that they starve, that they, you know, they don't let them eat. And, and what they would do is that's how they would kill people. That's how they execute people. Is they just throw them into this den of lions. They'd close this rock over the door and they'd just lock him in there and he'd be in there with this whole den of lions. So look at what happens because he gets thrown in there. Verse number 19 and the king didn't like this. So the king, when, when this happened, when, when, they, when they brought Daniel before the king and just said, hey, look, he was praying unto God and you passed this law. So the king, like all day long, was trying to get him out of it, was trying to figure out a way, but he couldn't do it because he couldn't fight against the law and, and that would have meant serious problems for him if he, didn't, if he didn't honor the law that he signed. And the way that their system was, it says that their laws couldn't be altered. So like once it's signed into right, once it's signed into law, like it just had to stand. Like they couldn't amend it or change it or anything. Like he didn't have the power to do that um, for whatever reason in their kingdom. So as Daniel's, you know, he, he seals his face and says, okay, you need to, you know, this is going to happen. He said, but I know that your God is able to protect you basically. So that's what the king said. The king knew that, that you know, Daniel was serving the right God. And it was amazing. So let's hear in verse, in verse 19 here of chapter 6. We're almost done. We're finishing up. It says, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. So the king's going to check out what happened to Daniel. He couldn't sleep. I mean, you know, the whole night he was fasting. He couldn't sleep. So first thing in the morning he goes to see what happens to Daniel. Verse 20, it says, And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then send Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the, mouth, the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So God delivers him from this death. And basically what happens is it says, Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. God protected him. He was faithful. He was faithful unto death. He was faithful all the way down to the, to the last second. He didn't retract what he did. He didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I won't ever do it again. He didn't back down. He didn't apologize. He took his punishment, whatever man was going to give to him, and he trusted in God. He believed God, and God delivered him. God saved him. He's a righteous man. God is able to save him. So, again, another reason why you don't have to worry about what man is going to do to you. They could threaten you. Threaten you with your life. Threaten to throw you in jail. Threaten you with all kinds of different things. And try to do them. But if God's going to deliver you, God's going to deliver you, and no one can stop that. And what I think is, is, is amazing then what happens after this. So Daniel's free. He makes it the entire night without, without the lions touching him at all. Because God sent an angel to protect him and shut the mouth of the lions. So they wouldn't touch him. Look what happens then. These people end up reaping what they sow. 
See, what happens is when people bring railing accusations against men of God and people go after and start attacking the, rack, the, the, the man of God, it's going to come back and bite them. It's not going to be good for them in their end. What happens here then in verse 24 says, And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. No. Them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. So as soon as they get thrown in there, the lions just pounce on them and devour them and just break all the bones and just completely destroy them. So it's not that the lions weren't hungry. That's not why Daniel made it through the night. Okay, It's not that the lions weren't ready to devour them because they were. God prevented it from happening. And these people ended up reaping what they sowed because, again, it says, it says there that those men which had accused Daniel, they brought forth a railing accusation against Daniel. And those that would bring railing accusations against men of God, even today, people who are doing God's will, people who are doing right by God, they ought to watch out. They ought to take heed and, and fear God. Because you don't want to go after God's anointed. You don't want to go after... I mean, David, King David was a man that respected God so much. Even though Saul was going after him, if you remember, Saul was trying to kill King David, yet he said, I will not raise my hand to the Lord's anointed. Because he was anointed king over Israel, and he was anointed Lord, um, king over Israel by God. So David's like, I'm not going to lift up my hand against him. Even though he was going to kill him, even though Saul was going to kill David, David's just like, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to let God deal with this. He'll end up taking care of Saul. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be the one whose hand, you know, kills uh, Saul. And great story, the great book. If you haven't read the book of Daniel, do so. It's, it's one of the most exciting books. It's got some really cool prophecy in it. It's kind of hard to understand, but if you compare it to Revelation, you can get some, some, um, some good uh, understanding and knowledge from that. But, but these stories are amazing. Great stories of, of, um, of people who have boldness, people have wisdom, like Daniel had wisdom, he had boldness, he, um, he was faithful, a very faithful man, and um, he didn't compromise what he believed. We could use Daniel as a great example, as a great man of God, and we all should strive to be the type of, of Christian that he was, and, and try to make ourselves above reproach so that people can look at us as well and be like, wow, that's a hard worker. Wow, there's someone that I want to promote. There's somebody that I want to have to set over my whole realm. And there's somebody that I can't find any, anything wrong with. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father,